Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor Billy Hayes and writer, actress, Lisa Jane Persky. We're taping in the famous Hollywood Museum and I'm here with award-winning actor, writer, director Billy Hayes who was born and raised in New York and graduated from Seton Hall High School and Marquette University. He's directed TV episodes, plays, and movies, and also acted in all those mediums. He won the LA Weekly Best Actor in 2006 in a tribute to Samuel Beckett. Ah, I love that piece. Right? Shuffle, shuffle, step. Yeah. Had you ever done Beckett before? I hadn't, but uh, my friend and, and partner, Richard Bailey, he's produced a lot of theater I've done over the years, along with my wife, who's also done that stuff. Um, he'd worked with Beckett in the 70s. He actually traveled around Europe oh, with Beckett. Oh, he did. So he had a real taste for who Beckett was, and we wanted to do a tribute. So these are three little-known plays, and Richard kind of put them all together. He acted in one. I had the great privilege to act in another one. Got to grow the beard and the hair and play a blind, barefoot beggar with a fiddle in post-apocalyptic oh, New York. Sounds like a, a Beckett. A typical Beckett <laughs> with a mad king in a wheelchair. We have this battle royale. Wow. It was, just, it was wonderful stuff. No wonder you got the award. <laughs> it I, I sounds loved it. great. It's probably my favorite time on stage. I came out, since he's blind, I came out with glasses, oh. and I had my eyes closed from before the show started through the show, and at the end of it, Jeff Murray, who I love working with, would take me by the arm. So I literally never saw the stage and never saw the audience Is that right? the whole time I did the show. And the main thing that you talk about acting is, you know, listen, listen, listen. Right. When your eyes are closed, wow, are you listening. I could hear everything. Where was that? What theater? It was at Theater Theater, Jeff Murray's oh, Theater. Oh, th Theater Theater, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, the yeah. small theater, the small I black know. box space. Yeah. Which is funny because Beckett often said he, he thinks his theater should be seen in small, little small black oh, and boxes. Was it. And we, that's where we were. That was it, yeah. It's um, One Night in Miami's playing there. Oh, really? Now, yeah, okay. the Rogue Machine is there, theater, theater. Oh, right. Okay. Isn't it on Pico? On Pico, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Two, two love, nice theaters. I love the space. Yeah. Well, that took us to thinking about being blind, closing your eyes. Where, where did you get that kind of training? <laughs> I worked with Eric Morris for many years out here, uh, my acting teacher and friend. And did they tell you to do something like that? No, but I mean, one of the things as an actor, obviously you need to relate to the character and you need to find your as-ifs, your magic as-ifs as of the character. And this man was blind. And uh, the first couple of performances and rehearsals, I, I, I put dark glasses on, but I realized if I'm really going to do this, you need to close your eyes. And once I did, I rehearsed every time. And then, of course, I did the show. I would come out on stage. Unbelievable. I never saw the audience, which was an amazing feeling to go off the stage. No, no applause. They, Beckett all, often said, oh. no. So we would leave. It was a climactic ending where suddenly Jeff has got this big stick and I'm on the ground and he's up in the air and the lights freeze. And it would go black. And then we slipped quietly off. Jeff would take my arm. We'd go off stage and the audience wasn't really sure till the lights came up. Yeah. What to is, do, it, right? Is it over? <laughs> right. Is it, which is what Beckett wanted. Right. And I had friends who said, where the hell were you? Why didn't you come out afterwards? We wanted to talk. We love the show. I would leave. I'd go out. I was so dirty. I mean, literally, I rolled in the gutter. I had hair and stuff, which is for the character. I would go out. I would go like this. I would go to the back. I'd take my clothes. I'd get into my car, and I would drive home and take a hot shower and never see the audience. You wouldn't even see them. But we were it talking was... about the one-person play you were doing, yes. that, that you're doing, and right. you're taking to the Edinburgh Festival, right. which is... Um, an offshoot of Midnight Express. It's riding the Midnight Express, which is sort of taking in the full breadth and depth of what the story was. And you were invited to this Fringe Festival, yes. which yes. is so brilliant. But you said, I said, the great thing about your one-person show is that you're making contact with the people in the audience. And you said, I can't see beyond the... <laughs> Second row. Everybody else is out there. I 
vaguely throw the, the voice out to the back row, but I can only see the front two rows. But because they're right on top of you. And you, you know, in a one-man show, John uh, John Gould Rubin was just a brilliant director, and he really, from the very first rehearsal, he said, "Look at me, look at me," and I'd start talking. He said, "No, look at me," and he kept me focused on him. I was going to ask you why you know this material backwards and forwards. Right. It's 30, 40 years right. old. I don't know how old it is. It's very old, old. older than all of <laughs> right. us. Yeah. But I, mean, I don't even know if you were there. <laughs> I'm 66. It was I was 23 when this happened, you, so it was a long time ago. Were yeah. you were you acting before that? No, I was a writer. So I went to college to Marquette. I wanted to be a, a journalism major and a writer. And then after college, you got into this Turkish <sighs> jail. I was desperate to get out of my senior year of college at Marquette. I never quite graduated. I was a senior. I, I was desperate to get out in the world, experience life so I can write about it. And my friend uh -huh. had just come back from Istanbul with a little bit of hash, which is marijuana in his Black. back. And uh, next oh, hash, thing I know, hash, yeah, hash, yeah, it's, it's, it's pot. It's the same thing, right. marijuana. And the next thing I know, I'm in an Istanbul hotel room, taping hash around my leg and wrapping a cast around it and then smuggling hash from Istanbul to New York, you know. Looking back now, as you know, know. the idiocy of that move back then, it seemed like a good idea at the time. So, and then <laughs> after this all happened, then you started acting, obviously. Yes. Actually, when I came home, I stepped off the plane at Kennedy, a hundred reporters, I was talking back When and you forth. were freed. As soon as I was freed, and early on, people invited me to the local high schools to speak to kids, and oh, right. I, I kept thinking, why, yeah. why do you want to listen to me? Right. But I had a message for them, which is, if you're this stupid, look what can happen to you. And these young kids would get that. I love the energy back and forth with an audience. But that's what's so important for someone who's real to stand there and say, yeah. this is what I did. And then they all had a chance. They had seen the film. They read the books, whatever. So that Midnight Express experience has had lots of lives yes. over all these years, Many right? Many iterations of my story. Books. A book, a film, a TV show called Locked Up Abroad, where they did the episode. I just came back from London in April. My wife and I were there. They did the Midnight Express Ballet. I know. I wanted to bring that up. Could you imagine? <laughs> no. Who writes mm -hmm. that? And where Actually, does the music come from? Peter Schaufus. He's the director of the Danish Ballet Company. He was a brilliant ballet dancer himself for oh. many years, world class. He took over the Danish Ballet. Midnight Express was always one of his favorite films. And, of course, he read my book in 1979. So there you he are. He was aware of the differences between the book and the film and so on, which we can talk about. But he put together a ballet incorporating a lot of the movie and some of the book. And he used a bit of music from the movie, which if we go oh. on to the next version, he'll have to talk to Giorgio Moroder in Colombia about it. Oh, it was Moroder? G Giorgio G did Giorgio's that? Giorgio's Moroder. Yeah, oh, it was his music. Giorgio. I love Giorgio Moroder. So great. He was music. one of the first guests on this show. Really? Yes, because he lived up in Truesdale, and sure. he had his studio okay. there, and he was fantastic. He's an amazing guy. What, his music great. made the movie lift up and, of course, touches people's heart because music is so powerful. And oh. he used uh, Giorgio's music and uh, Mozart. And he combined the two Fantastic. and did an amazing ballet production. Peter wants to expand the world of ballet beyond classic. I mean, how many times can you go see Swan Lake? So he's done Princess Diana. He's done Rolling Stones ballet. He did Elvis ballet. He did Midnight Express. And he brought in, the critics hate him because where he's did, different. It's in England? Is that he where he performs? Yes, he we performed did it in, in London, London. London. At the 2,500-seat London Coliseum. Oh, I was man. watching. They had me in a little box up in the wings because I was there, but I didn't want to be with the crowd right away. I was looking at them, and I looked down, and I saw an elderly English gentleman, very wealthy, with a suit and the thing and the cane and all, and right next to him, punk rock girl with stuff in her hair and wings. Both of them fascinated on the stage, which is what Peter wanted to expand Fantastic. the world of ballet beyond the classical audience. That's so great. And then you've gone back again now and told the story in a different way, writing the Midnight Express. I, this is a way that it's never really been told before yes. because I've had versions of it. And of course, you've seen, if you've read the book, there's one thing. If you've seen the movie, it's something else. If you've seen the TV show, it's something else. If you've seen the ballet. This is me telling it in my own words. And how different were all of those things from the way you tell the story? You're, it was at the Blank Theater, and it'll be three or four days in, at Edinburgh. in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. At, the, at the fest. In Scotland. Well, I mean, to, to, to tell my story into a book, you have to take five years and a whole bunch of people and edit it down to a, a through line and obviously certain characters. We combine certain characters and things in the, to make in the, the one book. Person? Oh, no, no, in no, the no. Book. to make the first book, to make oh. Midnight Express happen. Oh. They then took that book, and Oliver Stone wrote the screenplay, and Alan Parker, brilliant Alan, directed it, and they then combined and changed things. The biggest change for me 
between the book and the movie is that you, well, the escape in the film is almost like an afterthought. I was just going to say, also, in your one-person show, you say Oliver Stone wrote that. Yeah. Wrote some of the dialogue. It's the two biggest changes is the escape itself, where you know that I escaped off an island in a rowboat in a storm, made for Hollywood, run through Turkey for three days, dye in my hair. They didn't use it. They had an afterthought. But the guard, take the key and skip out. And although it worked in the movie, I asked Alan Parker, first time I saw the film, I said, what happened to my rowboat? That, <laughs> that gave me back my life and my sense of self. Yes. Too. I got myself arrested. I caused all that pain to my family and the people who loved me. And I got myself out. And that gave me back my sense of self. And how strong were you? You rowed that boat. You came in at night. You were using your ears. You just talked about being on stage and, and hearing all this other right. noise. But with your eyes closed, you were in the dark. In the dark, rowing across from Imrali Island to the Asia Minor coast. <laughs> yeah, you were I listening. Was, I was listening, but I was also so lucky. I was desperate. Desperate men do desperate things. I was very desperate, Joan. And then I got really lucky. Three or four different times in the course of the escape, if it went this way instead of that way, I wouldn't be here now. But the Greeks, as soon as you said Turkish, I'm sure the Greeks were for you. Yes. You, they wanted to get you away from the Turks because that's a long battle. The Greeks and the Turks have been enemies for a thousand years yes. or more. Like the Armenians. Well, the oh, Armenians, of Armenian course. Of I also know that they would never send me back to Turkey, not for pot. If I killed someone, obviously oh, that's different. Aside from the moral karmic implications of killing another human being, I, I was busted for pot. It's hash, but it's pot, the same plant. Right. They will never, I just right. spent five years in prison. They'll never send me back to the Turks, not for that. And so, so that was, that was the, your story. Right. That's not the way we've seen it and heard about it all these different times. You've, you've worked through Actors Studio West uh, in hospitals telling this story. I worked with a group called the Imagination Workshop for a while where we would go out in three artist teams to inner city schools and to hospitals and to halfway houses and veterans places, put them in a magic acting circle and do acting exercises that have been modified a little bit for the populace we, we would work with, uh, half, halfway houses and, and schools with the kids and then a lot of times with Vietnam vets and I worked at Patton State Hospital wow. um, for, with the criminally insane for one semester, which was very interesting. Did, did they understand that you were busted and that you're you know here what? to teach or I not? I never mentioned to any of them no. my story because it wasn't about me, it was about them. Oh, what I they see. got was it, the acting circle, the magic circle freed them, whether it's 12-year-old kids who have never allowed because of their circumstances to be themselves or traumatized vets who are in themselves, when you put them in the magic circle and create a, let's, let's set up a village and you be the mayor and you be the post office. Is that office, what you do? And they would then interact and they would speak from their characters, which freed them and allowed them to interact with other people, which they wouldn't do without. I see. And it, it was a magic kind of thing for them. This is very much like we were talking about John um, Gould Rubin yeah. and directing. And you said he, you're talking to us. You know what you're going to say. Why do you need someone to direct you? I desperately need John to direct <laughs> me because I don't see the forest for the trees of my own story. And it's such a big ah. story, and there's so many parts of it. And Edinburgh, which is what we're going to now, they put a 55, actually it's 60-minute limit on each actor. Oh, that's why it was 60 minutes. 60 minutes. At 60 minutes, they swear they turn the lights out, the hook comes off, and they pull you off. So you want to finish so with them. So you had to focus your play. My, this show was much longer when I got to John. I would think so. He, John kept cutting. John's a terrific dramaturg. Aside from a terrific director, he helped me hone this down. He'd say, oh. we don't need that. I said, well, what about, what about? He'd say, no, no, no. I get it. And, or, or he said, we do need this. I said, well, that's obvious. He said, no, to you, it's not. So we would add where they didn't know. We'd take out I where see. it was redundant. So does he help write it? He doesn't write it so much you, as tell me. You rewrite oh, it Oh, I was rewriting every night. We'd rehearse all day. I'd go home, rewrite at night till 1 o'clock in the morning, send it to him. Next day at 10 o'clock, I'm back. We're rehearsing, and I'm trying to remember the actors, trying to remember what that idiot writer just changed the night before. Oh, right. But we did that for a week in New York. We did it for a week out here, and then we got to do the show the other evening. Oh, it so that... And it came together. So, so you really do need a director. Desperately, I need it. I needed it for my material, and as an actor, I needed it... Because I've told the story so many times, it becomes almost repetitive. I'm missing the, the validity of where things should be emphasized oh, or where respect. they're not. Right. Because he, would, he was my third eye. Right. And he also got me working, doing a one-man show. It's, you know, if you're on stage with somebody else, the most important person is the other actor on stage. What they're going to say, right. right? Well, there's nobody else on right. stage, so right. it's the audience. And I'm literally 
gauging the audience's reaction to what I'm saying. So you have to listen again. You have to listen again. You have to be aware and watch and listen. You need to be very aware of being to be an actor. Did they did did they laugh or gasp in different places? Yes, they did, which was always fun because you never quite know. One of the biggest laughs was uh, they put me in and these guys ran up, uh, Israeli, Turkish, is a Swedish. It, this is the tourist cell block, which is exactly. just a fact. I the audience was, went wild over that. I thought that was very funny. I had to take beat, <laughs> beat, beat, beat. Because it made you human. Well, it, I mean, here you are incarcerated, but it made you human. And we're going to leave. We have to leave. But what are the letters? The Midnight Express Letters is my new book out on Amazon. This is the collection of the original letters I wrote home to family, friends, and my girlfriend oh. mostly. It's mostly like it's a love story to, to a great degree. Oh, fabulous. To, uh, in the five years I was in prison, I used those letters to write Midnight Express. I put them all in a box in the attic for 25 years. I was throwing them out. I had them on the street. My wife made me bring them back in. My friend and lawyer heard about about this, read a few, made me organize and write them, and it actually, I find it quite interesting, the Midnight Express letters. 70 to 75, yes. and you met your wife right away. I met my the... wife at the Cannes Film Festival oh. in 1978, while Midnight was premiering there, of all places, at the height of Hollywood hype and bullshit, to meet <laughs> someone who I'm still married to That's today, right. so I'm such a lucky guy. That's so great. <laughs> Billy, thanks for Thank being you, with Jonah. us. Thank you, Jonah. My pleasure. Thanks for watching Billy Hayes. And you're going to see actress Lisa Jane Persky. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here taping at the Hollywood Museum, and I'm with Lisa Jane Persky, an award-winning actress who started off-off Broadway and moved on to TV, guest starring in a lot of series. She made films with Robert Duvall and Rob Reiner and on and on. But she was on the stage uh, with our favorite directors, Ron Link and, and Daryl Larson. She's a photographer, and she's the founding editor of LA Review of Books. So where do we start? Where were you trained? Um, I guess my training uh, is... Uh is uh, I got my training on the street in New York, pretty much. <laughs> you know, the streets uh, were full of people at, at, when I was growing up who were um, creative. I grew up in Greenwich Village, and, um, and I lived in a building with a playwright. Uh, his name was H.M. Katukas, and he often did plays at the Chino. And, uh, and we did plays on the fire escapes of our building. And oh. I was just, you know, kind of one of the, uh, what he would call, school for gargoyles. Is that Gargoyle? <laughs> yeah, that's what he called it. And he was listed in the phone book as B.A. Gargoyle. Is that right? Yeah. So did he, start, did he go on to have a career? Oh, yeah, he had a career. He, had a, uh, he won a Farrow Grimley Award for, for oh. one of his plays. And they were really outrageous. Uh, they were called camps. He called them camps, and this was before anybody used that term, really. And what was started. Pacino doing there at the time? Um, uh, not, it wasn't Pacino. It was the the Chino Theater. Oh, the Chino Theater. Yeah, Joe Chino's famous um, ah. Greenwich Village theater, where a lot of famous play, playwrights started there. Sorry, I got it confused, but I'm glad we straightened it I out. I must articulate, but also I have to correct. I'm I'm not the founding editor of. You're uh, co-founding. Yeah, there there are a number of founding editors of the Los Angeles Review. Well, how did that happen? I want to go back to, okay. to um, the gargoyles. But okay. <laughs> like, um, well, let's see. Uh, I was about to start a magazine, and, uh, and Matthew Spector suggested that I talk to Tom Lutz, who was starting the LA Review of Books, and it hadn't really fully gotten engaged yet. And uh, I told him what I was about to do, and he said, well, can you do that with us? Oh. So I said, sure, and I love to build things. That's my favorite. I just, and, you know, I have a lot of ideas about, you know, how to, how to do, how to facilitate things for other people. So, <clears throat> so I do that. I do that a lot. But as soon as something becomes kind of institutionalized, I'm kind of on to the next. Um, I was just <laughs> going to say, you're like former, <laughs> former, but you still I, I'm work with them, don't you? I'm editor, yes. Okay, let's go back to Gargoyles. You went from there, did you go to La Mama? Um, yes, so, so uh, when I graduated from high school, and I had no plan to be an actor at all. I, had, I was going to um, art school and I was learning graphic design and that's really what I thought I would do. But when I, when I graduated, uh, Katukas came up to me on the street and he said, darling, I've written a play for you. And he, <laughs> he described the way he walked as being 
like a washing machine. <laughs> so he came up to me kind of like this, shaking. And I've written a play for you. You must be at rehearsal on Sunday at noon. And uh, I'm sending someone for you. Really? So, <laughs> you know. and, and you're just out of high school? <laughs> yeah. And, and I just thought, oh, it's Harry, my neighbor. He's so great. Yeah. And, uh, and then he said, and the pay is $25 a week. And I went, oh, okay, I'll be able to do it. Sounds good, right? That sounds great. But I had no idea whether I could really do it. You know, I just thought it would be fun to do. So I didn't know what else I was going to do. And, um, and I, kn I knew I wasn't ready to go to college yet. I was going to take the year off. Mm. And uh, and so I went to I went to the rehearsal. He sent somebody to come get me, and, and we went to the rehearsal. And and it was at La Mama. It and, was at La Mama. And, and you know I really had a passion for it, and it was really really fun. Because there you go from La Mama to being lauded as Duval's daughter in the, the movie. I mean, from one star to totally different kind of thing. It's so funny how, you know, I mean, there is so much that happened in between, of course. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> but um but yes, as seen as a career that, you know, from afar that's really what what it was. It, it looked like, like it, doesn't it? It looked like you you were plucked from here and you did so well you went to there. But were you acting a lot in between then? I was. And I did I you know, in, but in that first play it was kind of prof prophetic in a way cuz I played the world's most perfect teenager. Oh, and yeah. um and it, it was a long time getting away from the idea of being a teenager, even though I almost wasn't a teenager anymore. But you still could play a teenager. Well, that's really <laughs> sweet of you. I don't think so. <laughs> so who directed that? So, so t t tell us how so that he, came about. So, so Katukas himself um, directed oh. uh, the, the play at La Mama. Then um, the next thing I got was the only thing I've been fired from, which, oh. was, which was a play, a Megan Terry play, where I was supposed to play a boy, and I just could not be a boy. I don't know why, so I just never could. And I was, it was with um, Harvey Firestein, oh. and Harvey <laughs> said to me, I'm not sure. So then I thought, well, maybe I'm not an actress, you know? Maybe I'm not an actress, because I, oh. I can't be a boy. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like there was a bad firing or anything. It was just like, yeah, I know I can't. I can't, can't play a it. boy. I don't know right. how to play a boy. So then I studied with Julie Bavasso. Oh. who was uh, just out of the Boom Boom Room, which I think a lot of people would probably remember. The and name she was is a wonderful actress. She was, uh, she, was in, uh, she was John Travolta's mother in Saturday Night Fever. Mm. And she was really a great teacher, too. Very difficult, but really difficult person. But I learned so much from her. And, and then I did uh, Women Behind Bars with Divine, who is our is mutual friend next? and how we know each other. And then, and Ron was directing that? That's right. And, and Billy Edgar, Sweet William Edgar, who I know you remember Very well. Very well, Sweet William. And we miss him so much. Um, we he, miss everyone. Yeah. Those were so fantastic, those days. They were. And your role was what? You weren't playing I a boy. I was playing the innocent <laughs> raped by the system. So, <laughs> so I go in, you know, I, I've been framed by my boyfriend and then I'm just thrown to the wolves, you know, these, these, these prison babes, and, and I go out, you know, pretty tough. And Divine? And Divine is the prison matron, played the prison matron who, who, um, who basically raped me eight times a week <laughs> for a year. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that play went to London. Right. Because my... And came here. Yes, it came here, but uh, it was in London, and... I took my kids backstage. They were like little girls, and we couldn't let them see the play because I was going to say the they must have been talking. shocked. <laughs> and so we took them backstage, and we took photographs with Divine, and we came back and showed the sister at Good Shepherd. And I said, "Look, sister, we had this wonderful nanny with us. It was a picture of Divine and her nurses." Oh, fantastic! <laughs> so we covered it very well. Yeah, Did you, were you in London with that? No, um, that had to be it. That was it. Bill, I think Billy Edgar and and Divine were the only um, Americans who could be in the who cast. Who could go? You worked also with um, Coppola on Cotton Club. On Cotton Club and on Peggy Sue Got Married and a couple of other smaller things. Yes. And how are you? How are you able to work with different directors? Because we go way from Ron Link. Bizarre to Coppola to John Carlino, who directed you, oh, right? Oh yeah, Louis John Carlino. I love him so. He was in what a dear, at SC dear when man. I was at SC. He was oh. just starting writing. I thought he was. Yeah, so he's a wonderful great. writer. I mean, that is. That's what I knew him as a writer, and he was getting all kinds gift. of awards at USC. Yeah, I mean, he was a great director. I, I you know, my first experiences in theater and in film, um, and in television were so unique and with with such prose. 
um, yes. that I sort of I sort of expected it was always going to be like that, and then it mostly never was again. You know, I mean, these were people who really were hands on, and and they directed in kind of an old style where you know you, for for example, with um, the great Santini, uh, Lewis took us. He, we had two weeks of rehearsal, which you never get anymore. Of course, you, no one can afford it, but um, he took us onto a beach, uh, the whole family, and just you know let us shoot guns together at targets uh, and and have a picnic you. and you know we really bonded um, and he made sure that that happened as a family and I think that really makes the movie but he just sort of had an instinct for it and Coppola and same thing with same thing same thing I mean um, the Robert Young who was the first person I Robert M Young who was the first person I worked with on te on television also um, very hands on you know very important to really understand what the character is in the in the whole piece, and and you know really explaining what what they want. We we t were talking about um, Divine, and Jeffrey Schwartz made a documentary, which I think you were very helpful to him in in finding people and also being interviewed. How does how does a documentary feel to you compared to this acting that we're doing? That's such a good question. I mean, and especially for me now because I, I, I didn't know myself um, very well because I, I started acting so so young yeah, and I right, played all these right. characters and I mean, I think a lot of the things, the roles that I played, much of it did come from inside me. I did get to know myself playing playing the roles. Um, but but I really, as I've gotten older, have become more content about who I am, mm. and I prefer really being in the world as myself. And, and then and answering questions like in the documentary that way, you well, mean? That, sure, that, uh -huh. sure. I mean, I think it's nice to now kind of get to know who I am myself and also to be able to share that. But also one of the other career paths that you took was photography. And well, you've used that in the LA Review of Books. You've used your photographs, your collages. Yes, um, I always took photographs. I mean, I just was fascinated <laughs> by cameras um, when I was really young. Cameras and radios. Um, I wish I could build a radio, but <laughs> but um, I can't do that. But anyway, yeah. I, and I'm and I love interacting with people, and especially one on one. And for me, taking uh, portraits has been a really good way to do that. Oh, that's what you. Yeah, they're that, beautiful too. They're kind of like you. offset. They're not like boom portraits like that. And before we leave, I know you chickens in literature, not chick lit. Right, not <laughs> chick lit. Absolutely I not love chick that. lit. Yeah. yeah, just for fun, I started this this blog, and I invite everyone to um, contribute to it. If you find something um, interesting about uh, a chicken in any piece of literature <laughs> that you're fond of, uh, let's send it send along to me at at, um, at uh, curated edition at gmail. Dot com and uh, I, and I'll put it up on my blog, which is Chickens in Literature. It's a actually a website, chickensinliterature.com. It's a lot of fun. I love that. The pictures are so great, and then there's literature to go along with it. The saw bell is my favorite. Yeah, oh, it's so great. Out. So you're writing a memoir. Yes. And we're going to talk to you the next time you come on, and you did some work with Lance. Uh, out loud. Oh yeah, I have. Uh, there's there's some photographs and a little bit of writing in in this new book about Lance Loud, which is really a, kind of a great document of of who he was, the most you know just vital, explosive right. person. Who like we so many remember, <laughs> like so many people that that we know. Yeah, and yes. we remember him well. Thank you so. Thank much. you so much, John. It's really great Lisa, to be on the so show. Lisa, so good to have you here. Thank you. And keep writing to J A Q U I N N 1 at AOL.com. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.